What is one thing that kind of sets Iceland apart? It is the remoteness. It's a feeling that it is kept up in the highlands in Iceland. The unspoiled wilderness, because you don't find that in many countries. My name is Nika and I'm a part of the 57 Hours team. I am joined by Solve and Marti, and we'll be chatting about hiking in Iceland, the recent volcanic eruptions, and just everything of the sort in Iceland. Yeah, let's just get into it. Solve and Marti, could you tell me a little bit about yourself? Um, what is your background and experience when it comes to hiking in Iceland? I'm born and raised in a small village in East Iceland. I have always been much for outdoor activities. I've been skiing since I was just this tiny, tiny little girl. And then in 2005, I joined a group of women, friends, and we started a hiking club. I started to hike every year for three days in a row. And since then, I'm just hooked on hiking. We've been hiking all over Iceland and to some places abroad as well. but mostly in Iceland. I've been working in the tourism sector for 30 years or something like that. And I joined the Icelandic Mountain Guides uh, eight years ago, and I organized the hiking tours and trekking tours we operate here. Nice. Solve? Yeah. Like Matti, I was partly sort of raised outdoors, going on a lot of small hikes. Although I would say, I think it goes for a lot of people in Iceland. We did never really self-identified as hikers or buying a lot of gear or anything like that, but still going on a lot of trips and hiking on a lot of hills without it being a sort of a, a lifestyle that I, at least as a child, recognized as being anything out of the ordinary, something that everybody did. I was a ranger for a number of years, and then for the last 10 years, I've been working with IMG as a guy doing hikes. Nice. Perfect. So. Uh, th this is a question more for Solve. You said, you know, most people in Iceland don't necessarily I identify as hikers. It's just something, it's just something that you do and how you um, grow up. So when did you start professionally guiding and what, what made you choose the profession? As a ranger, I was mostly working in the Snifersness Peninsula and, and being a ranger is a, is a great job. I mean, it's, it's a lot of fun, but I saw the tour guides coming through, you know, and I, I sort of noticed that uh, while I was just operating in, in one small national park, you know, it's basically just one mountain in it, I felt envy, I think. I saw that, you know, this, oh, this looks like something I could do and, and should expand into. So I went to school for that and then I joined IMG and I've mostly been with my IMG since. On the topic of, you know, wanting to explore more trails, what is both of yours? Um, favorite thing about hiking in Iceland or maybe your favorite trail in Iceland? I always come back to Iceland and I think it's something that I haven't experienced in other parts of the world, sort of the freedom and the emptiness of being out in the highlands and not seeing a single person or being on trails that are barely marked, having to sort of find the trails, having to wait the rivers and sort of be really just feeling that you're moving through a, a, a wide, open, intriguing and challenging landscape together with friends. As for my favorite hike, I mean, the Loewer Trail is, is great and I know many, it's a must do. I mean, it's an award winning trail. I think my favorite trail is the Volcanic Trails, which is in the same general area, quite a bit further east. In many ways, different landscapes, still some of the same stuff, staying in cabins, hiking on trails sometimes black landscapes, sometimes green landscapes. And I think the reason I like that a little bit more than the Vega River is simply it's a little bit more challenging and it's not as popular. So there's a, a little bit fewer people. Nice. We'll we'll get into the specifics of the volcanic trails and all of the trails maybe maybe a little later. This is funny. I was gonna I was gonna give exactly the same answer why I like hiking in Iceland. It is the remoteness. It is the big, vast nature and you feel the freedom being one with the nature. It's a feeling that it is get up in the highlands in Iceland. You feel like you are just a spawn of sand in this big, big uh, nature. 
You know what I mean? So would would you say that the the remoteness of Iceland, it's kind of what what made it so famous in in Well the, yes, the unspoiled wilderness because mm-hmm. you don't find that in many countries, not in Europe anymore. It's not many places that are unspoiled and you know, just some minor paths where people have walked through. We we've talked about the remoteness, but another to you, interesting fact or one thing that kind of sets Iceland apart? The landscape. Because it is so varied. When you go on the Leuven Trail, you go from uh, a volcanic uh, landscape, a colorful landscape like you see behind me, and you go to a black sand desert where you see just black sand, and you finish with a lush green Icelandic wood and uh, white glaciers all around. So. That's Iceland. You don't need to go far when the landscape just totally changes. So you're never bored. Yeah. Nice. It's as if Alaska and Hawaii had a lockdown. Together. Yeah. I'm going to ask what, you know, what, what do you compare it to? What, what does it look like? I cannot compare it to, yeah. to anything I well, know. I guess we can see a little bit. Both of your backgrounds are very, very different. You, Solve, have you know, like the the lush greenery and then you, Marti, have more desert-looking um, hills. So maybe maybe that's good enough for now. I wanted to quickly, you know, before, before I start asking more specific questions about the trips and stuff, um, I wanted to address the, the volcanoes. You know, I think that this is a question that we have been getting asked a lot in the recent months. Could you give us an update on the current situation with the erupting volcanoes in Iceland? Well, the last time I checked, it hasn't erupted yet again. (laughs) We are expecting it any minute because there's a series of eruptions on the Reykjanes Peninsula. Maybe we should have a look at this video. So the eruptions that are occurring on the peninsula are so-called fissure eruptions. Magma comes to the surface, emerges as lava, and it flows and it covers a large area. In contrast to many volcanoes that erupt, where you have explosive activity, a mixture of gas and water, producing uh, volcanic ash and ash that forms in the atmosphere. International travel to Iceland is not affected by the volcanic unrest on the Reykjanes Peninsula. This is because the eruptions are confined to a small area and they don't pose any dangers to the atmosphere. This means that air travel within Iceland and also between Iceland and other countries is totally unaffected by the ongoing activity. So a volcanic eruption can affect air travel. If an eruption were to occur south of the Reykjanes Peninsula at sea, it could produce an eruption that creates volcanic ash. If this happens, there are well-rehearsed protocols to close the airspace over the area to assess the situation and to reroute air traffic. This type of work happens normally in Iceland, both during volcanic eruptions and during frequent volcanic exercises. The ongoing volcanic eruptions pose no danger to the operation of Keflavik, the international airport for Iceland. That's because the eruptions are at a safe distance away from the airport and the hazards are localized. The plate boundary on the Reykjanes Peninsula runs along the middle of the peninsula and Keplavik, the airport, is located on the northern side. It actually sits on the North American tectonic plate. When eruptions do occur, the airspace is closed temporarily where air traffic controllers assess the impact of the eruption together with staff from the Icelandic Meteorological Office and then the area is quickly reopened again. This has happened now on three occasions recently and it's caused no disruption to air traffic. There's no reason to change your travel plans for Iceland. The ongoing volcanic unrest will no doubt continue, but the eruptions are small in intensity, they're confined to a small part of the Reykjanes Peninsula, and the hazards do not project to great distances, so there's no emission of volcanic ash, no lightning strikes, nothing that you would expect to see from a much larger volcanic eruption uh, from from a typical peak-shaped volcano. So everyone is encouraged to visit, airports are open, travel is open, and business goes on as normal. I think that video answers a lot of questions that people are having. But um, one thing that I have for you is the video mentioned that that they will continue onto the summer, that this is pretty normal for Iceland. Um, How do you think that it will maybe affect the summer season, if it will at all? I don't think it's going to affect the summer season at all. It's far away from our hiking trails and it's localized in a small area and this on the peninsula, as he said. So I'm not worried about that at all. 
when it started, it actually started in 2021. Uh, and that was in a very remote area, far away from all infrastructure. And we call this a tourist eruption because we on Iceland, we all went, we hiked up there to see it. And a lot of visitors did that as well. But then it stopped and then it occurred again. And this is, I think, the fourth or fifth time it erupts since 21. And last time in November, it actually happened close to a town called Grindavik and okay. the Blue Lagoon known by many people. So people in the Hotel of Blue Lagoon and the Grindavik had to be evacuated. And some of them have moved back to Grindavik. Some have just moved to other cities until we know more about this. But this is likely to be ongoing eruption or, or series of eruption for the next, I don't know, maybe 100 years because last time this happens in this area was 800 years ago. And then it went down for... I think about a hundred years or so. Am I correct, Selvi? Do you know more? Yeah, yeah, so something like that. <laughs> well, at least a few decades more, it's very likely. So we have to live with this, and this is what the Icelanders do. We have that eruption in Iceland in average every five years, uh, so there's always something happening somewhere, and we just adapt to it like we do with everything else in Iceland. Yeah. Well, that, that was going to be my next question. You know, how is it for the locals? You, you mentioned that you hiked up to the eruption. Yeah, and maybe give us a story or two of how it is to live around something like that, because I don't think many of us have experienced it. No, actually, it hasn't been so easy to hike up to an eruption before, because usually it's been far away from where we live or under a glacier or something. So it was really, really fantastic. It was so amazing to go there and see it. So the so people of Grindavik need to find somewhere else to live because there are fissures now under the village or the town. So in some areas of the town, they cannot return. So yeah. just on the note of the, the people of Grindavik, just for everyone to know that their moving somewhere else is facilitated by the government, which has offered to buy a property of those that want to sell and just a bite in their town. So that's a little bit sad, but also sort of positive that they are allowed to do this. Like Mati, it's been mostly a very exciting time, I think, for a lot of people in Reykjavik to, to go and visit the volcano more often, sort of seeing it from a distance. But then at the same time, of course, now that it's happening close to that village, uh, you have a little bit of a bad conscience having been so positive towards it before. Nice. Well, I think that this this answers most people most people's questions about this. So I'll move on um, to hiking in Iceland. First, what do you think is a must-do hike for first-time visitors in Iceland? I cannot answer this question. <laughs> well, but there are yeah, so many yeah. beautiful hikes and a must-do hike. I cannot say. I like so many hikes. Most famous, of course, is the Leo track. I would recommend what I like a lot are actually two hikes we are doing. The hikes in the Valley of Thorsberg mm -hmm. is one. It's a valley uh, located between three glaciers and it's the last half of the Leogavu Trail. People stay there for one night usually when they do the Leogavu hike. But uh, Thorsberg offers so many possibilities of hiking and it used to be one of the most popular camp where Icelanders went when they were young. When I was young, I went there hike, hiking and camping. And that's actually where I met my husband. What? And we've been together for 30 years now. So, <laughs> so that's a good That's spot. where my parents met as well. Oh, okay. wow. And I met my first yeah, girlfriend there It as well. was a popular, like, uh, yeah, okay. And um, another hike is a new one we've introduced because I did this with friends two years ago. We call it Fjallabak. That's actually in the area of Landmannalaugar, which is a very well-known area. But we're doing like off the beaten path. We're not go do doing the hikes that everyone do in this area. We're going to find some other really beautiful places to visit. And there are so different hikes, three in, in four days. We do four different hikes, which are really, really different from each other. And what is uh, beautiful also about these two hiking tours is that uh, we stay for three days or three nights in the same path. So 
So we don't need to park every day and unpack. And we can also adapt the hikes to the weather conditions. Because when we are hiking from A to B, like in the railway track, we have to go regardless of the weather. We just have to go out there and do the, the day's track. So that's what I like about it. And there are so many others that we will probably put on the market shortly. Yeah. <laughs> in the east of Iceland, of course, there's one called the Viknaslaver hike, which is beautiful and many, many more. Yeah. So there anything to add or w was it covered? No, this was perfect. Yeah. I'll, uh, I, like Matti, I think I'm a little bit anti-bucket list. I think, you know, there are so many different things to see in Iceland. You don't have to do them all. You can come and do a couple of things. Lööver trail is, of course, excellent. And then, again, mention volcanic trails. I'll get back to the Lööver trail and volcanic um, trails, just, you know, details. But to, to keep general still... What is the weather like in Iceland? If you can maybe run us through each of the months from May to September, which is when the hiking season runs. So I don't think it's possible to generalize that the weather is one way in May and a different way in August. It's always unpredictable. It's always extremely variable for seasons in a day, right? Yeah. Uh, often, you know, you get a little bit of a storm, a little bit of a rain, and then a surprise snowstorm, even in sort of late July, you know. But as a rule of thumb, I think later in the season is probably going to be a little bit warmer, but it's not guaranteed, you know, but it's sort of a rule of thumb. Um, you should always bring with you rain gear, even though it's not forecasted to rain and something warm, even though we are expecting warm days. And then just be happy that we are hiking in shorts and just you brought the woolen stuff, you know. If we are looking at sort of, uh, you know, the lower hike starting in middle of June and running until late September, what I can tell you is that if you're coming in the middle of June, there is going to be snow in the high points in the mountains. So we are going to be walking on snow and sometimes that's a little bit scary or uncomfortable for people. But the positive aspect of that is that um, you sort of don't have to do the colonies as much. If you're coming on the tour in late August, it's probably not going to be a lot of snow. But then we are sometimes going to have to do down and up and down and up into little gullies that are just filled with snow, you know, in the middle of June. So that's a positive aspect. My favorite season of all seasons would be in June, beginning of July. Because then you have uh, 24 hours of daylight. Yeah. It is so amazing. And you are surprised every time when you can just go out at midnight and the birds are singing and, and the sun is shining. And, and the problem is that you don't get much sleep because it's difficult to go to sleep then because you want to be out and experience this. But yeah, that was actually going to be my next question. Um, do people have a hard time sleeping with the long days over the summer or, you know, do, do people just kind of adjust? Yeah, I, I adjust, well, we just have some blinds in our bedrooms. So that's not the problem or people can, you know, use the eye masks if you have a problem, but usually we, I don't use it and we adapt fairly quickly to this. Yeah. So maybe recommend, um, you know, a, an eye mask for sleeping. Mm -hmm, definitely. Yeah. Nice. Um, if you're coming in June, July, in August, it's already starting to be dark during the night. So in September, of course, as well. Okay. So, so that, you know, you mentioned this of like when people are asking what, what the temperature, what the weather is like every month, you can't really answer. Just be prepared for all four seasons and in that will come to you during the week. Yeah, people are wondering, so for hiking during the day in June and July, could they expect to be hiking in shorts and then maybe have their rain gear on hand? Uh, like, will it get warm enough to hike in shorts? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Um, and then a bit of a different question regarding bugs. How buggy does it get, especially mosquitoes, in uh, maybe July, August, yeah. Oh, there are no mosquitoes in Iceland. They just haven't made it over. <laughs> uh, but we do have midges, those small flies, smaller than mosquitoes. And some of those can bite a little bit. They come in waves. So, you know, 
you might it's again a little bit unpredictable but late july or august you might run into them in sort of the, for example in the lower trail near the end when we're descending into the valley of Thorsberg. so it's not a bad idea to bring a bug net and some spray i and never to bother with that myself but, but it's not a bad idea and it's unlikely that you're gonna have to use it but it, it come you know there'll be like a week in July where there's a lot of bugs and then another week in August some years and some years there's you don't notice them at all yeah again the same answer it's just unpredictable yeah yeah you can't know perfect um and then Someone is wondering, so they are booked on the Loigiver tour at the beginning of June, so June 16th, which I'm pretty sure is the first week. Could it happen that due to maybe the snow on the ground or something, they can't go then? Or does that usually not happen? It has happened. It has happened that it was not possible to drive to, to the starting point. But what we did that time, it was in 2015, if I remember correctly, we started and the other side and did the trail vice versa. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we find a way to adapt. If it's not open uh, in the middle of June, it has to be a really, really lot of snow. So it's unlikely, very unlikely. Let me see what, um, so for river crossings, and this is also something that you mentioned, what shoes do you recommend and how how often do river crossings happen, for example, on the Loigiver Trail? So on the Loigiver Trail, we, if I recall, have four river crossings that we take our sh sort of shoes and socks off and, and go waiting. Sometimes people uh, just have bare feet and then I usually ask them to put a woolen sock on just to, for sort of stability. Um, most People bring some sort of uh, an old sneaker or a sandal, and that's often very good. Yes. Some people invest in a neoprene sock or a special neoprene shoe, and that's most comfortable. That's that's best. Yeah. One of those rivers in early season, we don't always have to do it because there are often sort of thick layers of snow on top of it, so it's possible to bypass that. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, they are very variable some of the easiest rivers we are doing are, are barely ankle high uh the hardest one might go up near the knees on the on the worst days but then we have techniques to compensate for that go together okay. and it's a lot of fun it's usually one of the more fun points what, what i use for crossing rivers is very cheap beach shoes you can buy in all supermarkets they are really brilliant for crossing and often just an old old pair of shoes, old pair of sports shoes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Okay, fine. On that topic of gear, we're getting quite a few questions. What are just the, like the general things that people need to bring? We've mentioned uh, rain gear. What is what does that mean? If you can just give us some specifics. So, if we start at the outermost layer, when I when we talk about rain gear, we're talking about something that's light and breathable, like Gore-Tex or or another brand. It doesn't have to be Gore-Tex. But we are not really talking about something that's very thick or warm or non-breathable. Something that's comfortable to hike in in the mountains. Then an, another layer, something like a woolen sweater that you can zip up. Maybe another layer on top of that and then a woolen base layer. And I think it's a good idea to bring those things even if you're coming in late July, early August. When it's, you know, knock on wood, unlikely that you need all of that. But it's just safer. I mean... We can get a snowstorm coming. Um, yeah. Can I talk about shoes as well? Should we? Uh, yeah. Yeah. As for shoes yeah. that you take on the lower trail, I know that everybody is different, and and some people really prefer low shoes or running shoes. And if that's how you generally hike in the mountains, I'm not going to say no to that. That's fine. But for most people, I would recommend and um, something with ankle support, something with a very rough sort of thread where the sole is, is sort of you know complicated and grippy and of course there are all sorts of types of boots and m most of them will work but if you would ask me sort of what i use and what i recommend you know hopefully somebody is wondering i would go with uh, something that has a lot of water resistance uh i personally wear leather boots but i understand not everybody wants to 
by leather these days, but I think there are some like technical shoes now that have a lot of water resistance without being leather. I could high and a lot of water resistance, a rough terrain. You know, and I know that we've we've talked a lot about the Loigiver Trail, but we haven't actually, you know, addressed the trail. Um, it's gotten very popular in the recent years. So could you maybe give me a quick overview of hiking on the Loigiver Trail between huts? What, what does it look like? Yeah, just a quick synopsis. Quick. So, <laughs> the, so the Loigiver Trail is a uh, four, five-day track mm-hmm. about 57 ish kilometers but you can correct me if i'm wrong uh, 55 uh, 55 it starts in landmanalauga which is one of the most powerful geothermal locations in iceland colorful mountains the mountains behind mati are from there we're hiking through that sort of landscape and we start by climbing a little bit it's a short day the first day 500 uh, meters of climbing up into the mountains around Hrabtinu Skier, and that's where we might see some snow. We'll also see a lot of uh, a lot of obsidian up there, more colorful mountains. We're staying in rustic huts, and the most rustic one is the first one up in, up in Hrabtinu Skier. Second day, we are hiking over an entire caldera. It's uh, a rough sort of landscape. If it's raining, it's a little bit muddy. Often it's a lot of snow. Great, expansive views. A lot of geothermal uh, sort of little tools. Then we get to the rim of the caldera. We look over just an impossible sight of various mountains. Three glaciers in the distance. We descend off the caldera. We sleep at Altava which is this beautiful hut, just by a lake, green mountains, black sands. Third day is sort of flat, and we're just walking through lava fields, through vast sands. And the fourth day, we are slowly descending to Bosmark Valley, which is a forested, green, texture, complicated place. I was about to ask um, if you could tell me a little bit about the huts, and specifically, people are wondering... um, Inside of the huts, is it heated? Is it not? What is the shower situation? What is the food situation? So, yeah, if you could give us a little bit on that. So the huts on the lower level trays um, are cozy. You know, they're they're not big areas. They're fairly small mountain huts. We are staying in communal rooms with the people we are traveling with, and sometimes other travelers will join us in a room depending on how many we are. As a rule of thumb, they are nice and warm. The very rustic one I mentioned in Trapdinuskir is uh, heated by geothermal energy and it's usually very, very warm indeed. The others will have gas heating, which we can turn on and, and just adjust to our liking depending on what the weather is like outside. Uh, we get luggage transport, so we have relatively luxurious food for, for these sort of mountain cabins, and that's one of the benefits of going with us. Most times, you know, there's going to be a good feeling in the group, and we're all going to uh, chip in a little bit with the cooking and preparing the meals. Then we're just talking in the evening. Uh, I'll tell a story or two. People bring board games and card games. And then we sleep in that sort of uh, fairly tight situation. That's sometimes a challenge to people to, to be able to sleep with so many other people in the, in the room. But you just have to sort of get into the feeling of it. Or bring me a plug, that's good too. I always tell people, you know, if you if you uh, wake up in the middle of the night and you have a hard time falling asleep again, just accept it. Say, I may not be sleeping, but I am resting. Okay. <laughs> I, I'm resting. Okay, nice. Um. And just to clarify, the luggage on the Loigiver Trail is transported from hut to hut. So you're only hiking with a day pack. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. And then kind of on that on that topic, uh, what what is the fitness level necessary for this? I know that you're not hiking with a giant backpack, but it's still quite a bit of hiking. So yeah, if you could give us a little more on that. So you have to be able to hike for four to seven hours a day. And uh, the biggest sort of uphill day is that 
500 meter climb. So I would suggest that everybody that's thinking about this trip, just, you know, test yourself. If you have the means, go somewhere near your home where you have some hills. And just see if you can hike or can you take a walk of five hours and up some hills. And if you can't do that, you can join this trip. For me and for many people who come on the trip, the Lögadöver is not an incredibly challenging trip. It's, the days are not incredibly long, you know. But of course, we all come from different backgrounds and we might have different levels. And I would suggest that people just uh, test themselves, go out and walk for a little bit. Most of the huts have washrooms and showers outside of the main hut. So you have to put on your shoes, throw on a jacket if you'd like, and walk over to a sort of a washroom. Most of the huts have showers uh, that are not included. You have to pay, I think, 500 ISK is the current rate. You can buy a little ticket from the warden for uh, five minutes of showering because they're heating it with gas. The only hut that doesn't have showers is the first one I mentioned, the rest of the one in months. But that's also my favorite, so there you go. <laughs> okay. And just for those wondering, 500 ISK is about three and a half euros, three and a half US dollars. I know that the euro and the dollar are about the same right now. We've talked about the Loy Giver Trail. There is three other trails that we have um, kind of mentioned. And for those who are wondering about the spelling, you know, what these are, Maya dropped the links to each one of these in the chat so you can look at them. Um, but looking at all of these, what is the best trip for a beginner, maybe? I would say for a beginner it would be the Thorsmer hike because the hikes are not that challenging. Also that if people are not feeling well and don't think they can do the next day, they can stay in the hut and do like a small hike by themselves along the hut. What is maybe the the hiking mileage of the Thorsmer hike? I don't remember the mileage uh we have everything in kilometers in iceland but may we we uh we decided to to take it down a little bit to to challenge people that they're not that fit to come on this one so we would maybe hike for four max five hours maybe maybe this is a, a better thing so out of the kind of four hikes that we're talking about how would you rank them from, you know, most beginner friendly to more advanced? Mm. A Thorsberg hike is the most beginner friendly. And then I would say the, the, the Fjallabag as well. There's one day that could be a little bit challenging though there, but then the, the Lerwood trail and the most challenging would be the, the volcanic trails, because then we will hike per day between 18 and 24 kilometers. I'm sorry, I didn't put down the mileage. No, 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 that's, that's okay. I'm... The, the Lego trail is from 12 to up to 18 max, maybe 19 max. Mm. Perfect. I'll move on from this now that we've kind of, uh, figured out the fitness levels for arrival to Iceland, where do people come and where would you recommend that people stay or go before like outside of the booked hikes oh there's so much to do in Reykjavik there are plenty of day trips you can book or you can go on a whale watching tour or you could uh, visit museums uh, really good restaurants in Reykjavik what do you recommend to your clients Selve? Mm. so I absolutely recommend that everybody should go and visit a public swimming pool in Iceland. Yes, exactly. I mean, mm -hmm. do the do the fancy spas, that's fine. Um, but visiting swimming pools is such a huge part of Icelandic culture. Many normal people would go four times a week, and that's not a swimming fanatic. It's just something everybody does. Mm -hmm. They're nice, clean, cheap. And it's not only about swimming. It's about sitting in the hot pots or sort of the hot tubs, you would call them and conversing with people. It's like the hot tub for the Icelanders is like the cafe for the French. It's a and public the for the British. <laughs> there you go. Come before th that is recommended. I'm quickly going to go back to the hiking. Most of these trips are hut to hut trips. Um, how does booking the huts work? You know, are hut spots guaranteed? 
And is it possible to sleep outside of the hut with a tent if somebody wanted? Yes, we pre-booked the hut uh, one year in advance. So we have spots for all our groups guaranteed. If people want to bring a tent, that's, of course, not the problem. And they can always sleep outside. And um, is is that sleep? Can you still use the um, uh, amenities of the huts if you sleep outside in the tent? If you're part of the group, yes, of course. You, yeah. Perfect. Um, and then... How many people sleep in each hut? I know that the hut si- sizes vary a lot, but maybe on average or, yeah. I think they can they can host from 50 up to 80 people maybe mm-hmm. in different dormitories. Okay. Um, and then to go into more of the, the group, you know, the, that's a lot of people to be with. What are the minimum and max group sizes for these trips? For the Lego River Trail and the Thorsmark hiking, the maximum is 16. And for Volcanic Trails and the Fjallabak, the maximum is 14. The minimum is usually six persons, except for the Lego River Trail where there is no minimum. If we have two people, we would operate that one. And I just I just want to do one clarifying thing because I see um, people are saying, you know, that they have... Um, have gotten different advice for different trips in Iceland regarding tents and stuff. I do just want to clarify that all of this is for, you know, kind of the four trips that we're talking about. There are other trips that go more into the highlands, which is a more remote part of Iceland. So Mm -hmm. this advice will vary. On um, the group questions, what is the typical age on these trips um do people come solo and uh yes many 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 people come solo i think a lego level we don't exactly have the age of the people but my feeling is that it's maybe 50 uh, 40 to 60 what do you think Salve? So something like that might be the average i think some of the oldest people i've had on trips might be sort of 80-ish and the youngest I've had some kids but often on the lower trips often groups of 20 year olds as well but, but I guess the average might be around 40 50. Is there a good in-between season to combine both hiking during the day but then also maybe be able to see northern lights and things like that during the night? Absolutely so uh, middle of August you start to get proper darkness during the night I think I'm correct in saying sort of from 20th of August, it will be dark enough at around midnight. And then it changes fairly fast. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, late August, beginning of September, we frequently see the northern lights just uh, walking to the bathroom. And this is this is a food question, Solve. You've mentioned this a little bit, but uh, dietary restrictions for hikes, um, is it pretty easy to accommodate them or how does that work? That's generally very easy if you inform us beforehand. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then for the hut to hut hikes, do people need to bring sleeping bags? What kind of sleeping bag would you recommend? Right. So uh, in the hut, and mm-hmm. I, I, again, I guess everybody is different. There are mattresses that we sleep on. I bring a very old, extremely thin sleeping bag. So mm-hmm. I feel that when I'm sleeping in a room with and uh, maybe 18 other people, uh, that room gets hot for me and I'm more comfortable just in a very thin sleeping bag. And I don't think I'm that abnormal. I think uh, for most people that are not uh, uh, not too worried about cold, it, these are warm rooms. You don't need a very big sleeping bag. If you bring sleeping bag liner as well, sometimes it's enough. Okay, so no need to do much bigger. And then... Um, you know, since all of this is transported from hut to hut, what uh, what kind of bag do you recommend that people pack? A hard suitcase, a duffel, in addition to their day pack? Definitely a duffel bag because we need to pack them into a trailer and best if it's waterproof, but that's not necess- necessary, but best enough to bring a hard suitcase. And also there is not much space in the hut, so don't pack too much. You bring your three layers and maybe one extra layer, but don't take too much clothes with you. It just gets your, it gets your life more complicated. 
And then uh, hiking poles. I, I got a few uh, questions about hiking poles. Recommend them or not specifically maybe for the Loikover Trail? I absolutely recommend them. I, uh -huh. I swear by hiking poles. I think it's safer for your body and I think it's more balanced when you're going up and down. So I would recommend everybody bring hiking poles. Not everybody does. And that's it. You're not going to be sent back. If you don't like hiking poles, if you've never used them before in your life, you know, that's okay. But as a sort of a lifetime advice, I recommend everybody get some hiking poles and practice. Nice. Um, and then we've kind of uh, outlined which are the easier trips, which are the harder trips. But specifically for the Lloyd Giver Trail, there's a four and a five day itinerary or five and six. I, I'm maybe misremembering. Five and six. Five and six. Sorry. What is the difference between the two? Is there a big difference? Um, and what would you recommend for people? Okay. So now we have on the six day tour, the only difference is that we stay two nights in the last hut in Fosmer, which is the most luxurious hut. And there is one extra hike up to the Timberde House Pass and down again through another route. We used to do the hike all the way to Skowar up to Fimre House and back the other side, but we don't do that anymore. So yeah, so the difference is, is this hike. Yeah, I will just say, you know, hiking poles and things like that, things that might be harder to travel with, uh, people can rent from you, is that correct? Yes, and sleeping bags as well. Perfect, there we go. Um, is there places to get water along the trail? Not every day, okay. uh, but at every hut, there are places to fill up water bottles. So it is a good idea to bring maybe two bottles and carry one, but it's only one day where there's really no opportunity to refill. All the other days will have moments where we are near mountain streams and where there have been no recorded cases of Giardia or something like that in Iceland. So everybody safely drinks from small mountain streams. And so that, that those are opportunities on three of the four days. Uh, and can you charge electronics in huts? Yes. Uh, on the Leuven Trail, you can charge electronics for a fee. So you have to bring it to the warden and the warden will charge that for you. Uh, we recommend though that people bring the power banks with them to charge because okay. there might be a long queue for charging. And sometimes there is no electricity because it's sun solar powers, isn't it? So yeah, yeah to be safe, bring in, bring that. And you can, but you can't buy in the house. You can buy power banks. Yeah. These days yeah. they, they also sell little power banks. And yeah. And then final question, uh, can you buy food and drinks on, uh, on, along the Loigaber trail? Not much, no. There is a small restaurant in Altavaf where people can go and buy beer and maybe something. And uh, on the last hat in, in Fosbark, you can buy something or small stuff, but we bring everything with us from Reykjavik. We bring fresh food from Reykjavik and, uh, take it along all the way. Mark. When do huts open and close? Usually they they don't open until the road is open in the, the middle of June. Although the hut in, in Lampanalegar is open through the winter because a lot of people go there either skiing or with big super trucks and stuff like that. And they close us usually in the middle of uh, September again. With that, Solven Marti any closing words that you would like to let us know? Yeah, but uh, thank you so much for having us. It's uh, it's nice in the middle of winter to start thinking about summer with you guys. I hope uh, everybody feels that they learned something or that you feel a little bit more safe and secure to come to Iceland. And hopefully I'll, I'll see you next summer. I, I think some people commented that they were on the first year. You have me. Yeah, I would just like to say thank you for having us. And we are just thrilled to have so many people interested in Iceland. And, and we are really looking forward to, to having you and to accommodating you this summer in Iceland. Last thing, Solve, I was asked where your background is from. This is from the volcanic trails. This is uh, sort of descending uh, 
Multa von sort of rabin sind to lava pill uh, called skylinker where, where there are quite unusual lava formations that sort of the, almost like tables made out of lava. Yeah. Come on the trip and I'll explain it more to you. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you, everyone. Um, feel free to email us. I hope you have a lovely day. Um, if any questions, you know, we're here to answer them. Shoot us an email. Uh, and hopefully we'll see you in Iceland when with the sun and the rain and everything in between. <laughs>